Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome once again to the Oceans Institute livestream, where we bring you a different researcher every fortnight in marine sciences. Today we have someone rather special with us. We have someone who is interested in the migration of humans across the Pacific Ocean, which is of course our largest ocean. Someone who's also equally interested in botany and what plants can tell us. And someone who's, I guess, a champion for women in STEM and the first women in this exciting field. Dot Thank you. So Emily, we're going to get to know you pretty well over the course of today. But as always, just a reminder to our audience that the chat log is open. And just to prove that we are live, you're able to drop your questions there anytime so that Emily can answer your deepest burning queries live. But Emily, um, let's start off the show by asking a really obvious question. For people perhaps don't know anything about either archaeology, botany or migration of humans, what is it that your research is actually focused on? Okay, so my specialty is in archaeobotany, which is basically looking at botanical remains that we found in archaeological sites mm -hmm. when we do excavations. Uh, and that's to use these botanical remains to actually understand the history of relationship between people and their environment. Um, and so, for instance, at the moment, um, I'm working with students on trying to apply this in Australia, but I'm also uh, collaborating with colleagues in the Pacific, which is my area of speciality. Um, so I've got one colleague uh, who's Guillaume Moll, um, who has done excavation in French Polynesia. And so I think that's one of the maps that I, I so gave So for those you. of us who are as ignorant about geography and the oceans as I am, I'm just gonna show up the map of French Polynesia. Um, so French Polynesia, whoops, that would be the circle in red on the screen right now. Yeah. Um, so, so he's excavated um, sites in the Tuamotu Islands mm -hmm. um, uh, in French Polynesia, uh, and he excavated in, uh, in specifically uh, ritual sites, which are called marae. And I think I've also sent you an image by Guillaume uh, showing one of these marae. Um, so are which the marae were... the, the stone structures, or are they the whole yeah. site? So there were temples that were being used by people uh, living in the islands. Uh, and so he sent me the charcoal that he found during these excavations. Um, and so I'm looking at these to try to identify the taxa. Uh, and for with this, for example, we are really interested because um, these islands, uh, Tuamotu islands, are atolls. So atolls are really low-lying islands. And I sent you another image, I think, that shows what it looks like from the sky. So um, I have no idea what any of these were at all before this show. <laughs> Let me just try and bring that up for you. Atolls, atolls, great. So atoll, um, I've got in front of me the ring-like structure in the middle of the ocean. Yeah, so that's an atoll. That's what it looks like. So it's it has this internal lagoon mm -hmm. uh, and the circle around is a very narrow band um, of earth and sand, basically. Uh, where the people have been living. And today, uh, a lot of the as these atolls in French Polynesia are completely covered by coconuts uh, mm -hmm. because people use them to produce copra mm -hmm. out of the, the, co the actual coconut um, that is on the coconut trees. Uh, but we know that the vegetation used to be more diverse than that. We're not really sure how and when it changed. So that's what we're trying to look at. And, uh, and for example, in the charcoal that I've started looking at, I, I did find quite a lot of um, remains from coconut trees, uh, but also other trees that used to grow on the island uh, or that might have been introduced by the missionaries who came here in the 19th century from Tahiti, for example, mm -hmm. which is a high island. Um, so I, for example, I found charcoal from Terminalia, uh, wood and I think I also sent you a picture of this tree. Um, so this is the tree that came from Tahiti. Yes, okay. probably, 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 um, because so there's also early, a they, make it, they use the coconut to make was it copra? Copra, yeah. Oh. So it's used to produce the oil, oh, okay. uh, coconut oil that is used in in a range of activities. But then the tree is used for something else. This particular tree. Well, the tree, uh, for, it might have been one of the native species that was on, on the island. Um, and so people would use the wood for fuel, but also uh, the fruit of the tree for a different range of activity again. Um, and so we need to do you know, much more work to find out about that. Um, and do you know sort of the time range where this tree would have made the transition from Tahiti to here? 
So that's that's what we're trying to understand. So the remains there are from um, probably the early 19th century. So that's when the missionaries came mm -hmm. uh, on these atoll islands. And we know that some of the people from the atolls went to Tahiti and then came back. So they might have you know, brought the tree with them. Um, but it, we also need to do a bit more work because it might be one of the um, actual species that were growing on the island before. So we need to explore all of this by looking at more samples. So, And all of this you can tell just by looking at the charcoal? Yes, and, and also understanding where the charcoal comes from, mm -hmm. obviously, which layers of the sites, uh, and then try to correlate that with the dates that um, my colleague will have on the site, etc. I think I actually have a few pictures of the charcoal coming up as well. Um, yeah. So this is a dig site. So this is you collecting samples. Which island? Is yes. It? So yeah, because um, you you were wondering um, about you know how we do that. What's the method? So the first thing I wanted to show is uh, the kind of thing that we can find when we're doing excavation, and it's not super impressive. Uh, so these are pictures from um, an earth oven where people used to cook their food mm -hmm. in the Pacific in the by digging a hole in the sand actually and and having a fire and having uh, the rocks to become really hot. And so it works like an oven. Uh, but it means that, <laughs> yeah, it is. And so it's full of charcoal. It's really rich. Uh, so then I bring back all the charcoal fragments that we have excavated in the lab. And by looking at them under the microscope, um, I can look at the anatomy of these um, uh, of these wood mm -hmm. that have been burnt. So the, the anatomy doesn't change when you burn the wood, um, which is very handy. Uh, and so I've put two different images of two different species because you start seeing that they are actually different. So the vessels that you see um, and the fibers and the, the rays and all the different cells, oh, they, really they cool. kind of arrange differently. And so you can recognize them as just, just so sometimes I say you, know, that you recognize image? the face of people. Mm -hmm. So would this be an electron microscope image? Yes, the these okay. are from the electron, wow. yeah, electron. So I'm, I'm looking at um, these vertical channels, I guess yeah. that's the going down the length of the wood. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it, it's kind of a 3D image. So you've got um, the transversal section and then the longitudinal one with the, so the when big... When you're looking at these features, which particular features... I guess, at the fingerprint of the wood, what are you looking for? Just the size of the pores, the arrangement? Yeah, all of them. It's actually a combination of all of them together. So the size um, and the number of, of the, these little round cells, which are the rays. Mm -hmm. um, some have really large rays, some have small rays. Uh, some have like several vessels together and other that are solitary vessels, they're called. Um, so you have to look at all of this um, to, and then compare that to a reference collection. Mm -hmm. Um, so part of my job is not just to do excavation, but also to go around the sites that we excavate and collect wood samples. Um, and then I burn the wood samples um, and, nice. and then I compare that to the charcoal I find in the archaeological sites. So there's a question. I guess it really does matter how you burn the wood. Are you trying to replicate quite closely what you think? Yeah, so we can't, it's hard to replicate um, actual you know, conditions of an archaeological fire because we don't know all of that. Mm -hmm. So we, what we do is that we, there's a protocol around the world when you do this kind of collection um, to create you know, charcoal at 400 degrees mm -hmm. in a very well-controlled kind of environment in a, in a specific oven. Um, and then you have your wood charcoal that you can compare. Um, and importantly, these wood charcoal comes from trees that you, you've you been able to identify because you work with botanists and with mm -hmm. traditional owners in the field. Um, because I'm not very good at identifying living plants. I'm very good <laughs> with dead plants. But... <laughs> That's amazing. So the trees talk, but only when they're dead to you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. It's a sort of weird tree corpse whisperer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so you go out, you pick out um, the samples and you try and recreate the original um, burning conditions and then yeah. you're able to, I guess, tell what the species were. And from that, what are you able to then infer? So the idea with that is um, you try to, you start recognizing the different species that are present mm -hmm. around the site and the one that people have been using. Uh, and then you compare that across the time and between islands, between different types of sites, so a ceremonial site, a habitation site. Um, and then that will give you information about the way that people were managing their environment and changing their environment. Mm 
Um, so, for example, in French Polynesia, we're trying to understand uh, the impact of European arrival, mm -hmm. uh, but also the impact of human arrival. So the island before there were any humans mm -hmm. uh, and what happens when people arrive and start settling this island and also uh, start uh, practicing arboriculture. So we have questions mm -hmm. around arboriculture and um, the way people were managing and changing forests. For example. So you start to see species that perhaps you don't expect to find yeah. those quantities and they start to emerge. Yeah, so you see species that we know are introduced from other islands, for mm -hmm. example, but we also see species that are native but are signs of a disturbance in the forest. Um, but interestingly, uh, we also see um, some diversity that continues. So when people arrive, they just don't burn everything down. <laughs> That's no. stupid. Um, so, of course, there is um, some kind of deforestation, but it's, it goes more into changing the forest. And mm -hmm. there's a, a term that a scientist has um, used in Southeast Asia, which I really like, which is she's talking about domesticating forest. Um, and I think that's the idea in the tropics and in the Pacific. It's not domestication of one species like we have in Europe right. for agriculture. So it's not just all it's, pine forests. It's, yeah, domesticating the landscape. Right. So um, by um, maybe helping trees that are useful to grow mm, exactly. and, um, and sometimes planting them as well. And it's really the practice of gardening, but on a large scale. Beautiful. Um, so I've got a picture now of a few different forests and some yeah. structures. Um, could you just explain what's, what's going on here? Yeah, so these are examples of what I'm talking about because um, I guess when you don't have um, a background or when you're in, in this region, uh, not just in Archibotany, but because I think it makes sense for actually indigenous people living there, they don't see it as just a white forest as maybe Europeans would mm -hmm. see it you know, when they arrive. Because all these images, they look like, you know, the tropical white forest, unspoiled. But they I can't tell not... any difference to me. That just looks yeah. like what you might so find, all like these... a natural forest. <laughs> I know. So all these arrows here, they're just showing different species that I, I know are typical species that are planted by people and used by people. Mm -hmm. So these are, you know, specific examples of gardens, forests, which are gardens. Um, and so, for example, there's one picture here, um, I think it's on the right of the image, uh, that's in French Polynesia, and there is one arrow all at the top of the mountain that shows there's a coconut tree at the top of the mountain. Okay, and even I can tell people... that's not normal. <laughs> <laughs> no, so people used to, they planted coconut trees along the trails, for example. Mm. So that would show where you have to go if you want to be able to go on the other side of this mountain, for example. Um, and and the, the, it's the same in New Caledonia where you have specific trees which are sometimes for subsistence, mm -hmm. uh, like the breadfruit, but also sometimes really just symbolic trees. Um, so in New Caledonia, there is a specific type of um, um, pan colonnaire, it's called, uh, which is like a really elongated kind of tree. And people planted it because it represented um, the presence of human beings. And so it was always okay. planted where there were habitation sites. Oh, there you go. So then you can tell just from this tree being there that this is what the area was used for. Exactly. So, for example, when you look for archaeological sites in this forest, mm -hmm. if you see this kind of tree in the middle of, um, of what looks like a forest, you know there's going to be an archaeological site under. Huh. How fascinating. So you can almost use it like an indication. This is where to look. Yeah, wow. yeah exactly. Yeah. Fantastic. So you can tell that these are the gardens where they would have planted the trees. Um, and I guess bringing it back to the original question of human migration in the Pacific, how do you then build the journey of humans? Like, how do you know that this is? Okay, so the, the story of human migration in the Pacific is, is much more general and larger than what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm you know, looking at one really small piece of the story by looking at the plants that people brought with them um, and how they changed that. But then we need all the rest of the archaeological uh, material to tell the story. Um, so it's it's about finding traces of human on the island. So, for example, uh, pottery being found in, uh, in the levels when you're doing excavations uh, or lithic tools, so tools in um, rock being mm -hmm. made out of rock. Uh, and then we have the dating um, system, of course, which um, shows the advance of people. So, um, yeah, I think I, I gave you a map of, you know, a, 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 the actual map of the world, just um, to remember. Just before that, I just got in front of, of me. The actual size I've of got the in front of me some pottery as well. 
Um, so you're mentioning pottery, yes. and that's really interesting. So what I've got in front of me is an urn, I guess, some kind of vessel structure. Oh, yeah, so you're already looking at the Lapita pots. Um, yeah, the so pots. these are some of the specific pots that um, are found uh, in the western, southwestern part of the Pacific. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are a, sig a very good signature of the arrival of the first humans uh, in, in these islands. Um, but actually, before people arrive with the Lapita pots, uh, it's interesting to look at the, the map mm -hmm. uh, because it shows, um, because the story of people moving into the Pacific is interesting in itself in terms of the story of voyaging and sailing. Um, and also it's related to changes in the environment because when the first human beings, um, Homo sapiens or species, actually enter the Pacific area, uh, they do that 60, uh, around 65,000 years ago and they arrive in Southeast Asia and Australia and Papua New Guinea at this time. Sorry to be ignorant, but when you say arrived, arrived from where and through what means? <laughs> do they walk yeah. across and... So it's Homo sapiens, they, they've been moving from Africa okay. um, and then they arrived around Asia and then they start doing the very first, very first long distance crossing of um, oceans. Uh, so we're talking primitive boats at this stage. Yeah, okay. what the boats were looking but you know at. it was through water somehow. Yeah, obviously they knew how to build some and use some because they were able to move between uh, Southeast Asia to um, Australia, Papua New Guinea. And mm -hmm. I think on this map, it shows that at the time, um, the, the actual sea levels were lower. Mm -hmm. um, so there were two large continents, Sahul and Sunda. Yes, absolutely. So Sahul is the one that I guess is Australia now. And the yeah. other one, Sunda, um, do you know which nations? So are? Sunda is what then became all the island of Southeast Asia. Fantastic. Um, yeah, so Indonesia, the Philippines, etc. So we're talking that sea level was a lot lower then. <laughs> Yeah, they were a lot lower and the, the climate was colder and also uh, more arid. Mm -hmm. um, so it was quite different, but they still needed to cross um, the ocean uh, between Sunda and Sahul to enter mm -hmm. there. Uh, we've, also and got, then... um, we've also got two little circles. Um, yeah. Are they part of this story? Uh, yes, because uh, during this period of time when the sea levels are lower, people start crossing you know, longer actual um, sea distances. Mm -hmm. They go to some of these islands, um, which are around what we call today the Bismarck area. Um, so that's around 40,000 years ago. Um, and it's, a, it's already around 100 um, kilometers to cross actually um, in, in the ocean. But then uh, when the sea levels start getting uh, higher and, the, and Sunda and Sahul start becoming, you know, islands, archipelagos and Papua New Guinea and Australia, um, you, you would think, you know, maybe because it's, it's then a lot of small islands and there is even greater distances between the islands, mm -hmm. people would start being isolated in, on these islands. But no, they actually continue to get connected quite a lot and they adapt to these, mm. you know, new, much more fluid. So the gaps um, are definitely growing, but humans are somehow able to keep crossing those. Yeah, and, and I think it's important because that's really where the adaptation to sailing and to the sea mm. scape started. Uh, and so I've highlighted the Wallacea region because it's a very important region for this period of interaction and developing, um, you know, this adaptation to the ocean. So Wallacea, um, and, that's the big oval? Yeah, exactly. So we know that, you know, there is a lot of interactions going on, uh, especially after 5,000 years ago, approximately. Mm -hmm. And then because of all this, you know, movement happening, uh, there is a specific culture that appears in the smaller circle, in the Bismarck arch archipelagos, um, around 3,000 years ago, a bit more. Um, and that's what has been called the Lapita culture. Okay, with so these that's really the beautiful origin of pots. these pots that we're just showing up. Yeah. Um, so how yeah. old is that culture? So it started around 3,500 years ago uh, in this region. And, it, it, and then it kept going and moved with the people um, until around 2,800 years ago in the rest of the Pacific. Um, and I think the other maps then shows mm -hmm. this advance as well as the people. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, you can see these ceramics are really beautiful uh, and really striking with the decoration. Mm -hmm. So um, they're really important signature in the archaeological levels of, of people advancing in this region. So these particular fragments were 3,000 years old? 
Uh, yeah, because I think these ones are from the Bismarck, so they're probably more than 3,000, they're probably 3,200. They're so intricately decorated, all the little marks and yes. the patterns are so striking. It's beautiful. Yeah, so these little dentate decorations, people uh, think that they might have been done by um, tools that are similar to the combs that we use for tattooing. Mm -hmm. So, the so that means there's maybe. also probably, yeah, there's also probably... Um, you know, a specific signification around, you know, as well, tattooing mm -hmm. the pots um, and, and all the identity questions that goes with that. Yeah, fantastic. So these ceramics over 3000 years old from the Lapita region. Um, coming up next, we do have that journey that you were talking about. So obviously, so this is just after the continents would already have started diverging. Oh yeah, that's that's actually quite a long time after because okay. this um, the, the the sea levels getting down um, that's around ten thousand years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so this is when we start having all this interaction in Wallacea, etc. Mm -hmm. And then three thousand years ago, we have this hybrid culture that appears in the Bismarck, uh, and then people start moving into what has been called remote Oceania, so the part of Oceania that um, necessitated even longer. Uh, ocean crossing, so around mm -hmm. 300 kilometers, um, you know, between islands, for example. Um, and so the people carrying this nice pottery, the Lapita pottery, they start getting into the Southwest Pacific, so New Caledonia, Vanuatu, Fiji. Um, and we find this pottery and, and also other type of material with dates that really show that people are advancing like mm -hmm. that. Um, and then they go to Tonga and Samoa. And in Samoa, it's quite interesting because the Lapita pottery and the, the sites from this period are, are really um, small. So it looks like people didn't stay for long or it was a really small group of people arriving in Samoa. So that's mm -hmm. in the center um, of the Pacific here. Uh, so it, that's, that's the Lapita movement. But at the same moment as this is happening, we also have people who are starting to enter the islands in the northern part of um, the Pacific. Okay, fantastic. So this will be near where the Marshall Islands are? So it's it's not in the Marshall Island yet. It's more in the Marianas, so closer to the Philippines. Oh, okay, so um, Philippines and, and Caroline Islands. Yeah, okay, so it's so probably... The little circle that you're seeing on the screen right now. Exactly. So, so it's interesting. It's, 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 it's almost at the same time, actually. People okay. are advancing southwest, but they're also going north. Um, and, and they're not necessarily coming from the same region of origin, but... Mm -hmm. It's all related to what's happening in Southeast Asia and the islands of Southeast Asia and the Bismarck. Um, so they're really traveling all the time. And that's why I like to use the circle rather than, than the arrows, because mm -hmm. it's not about arrows. It's much more about movement everywhere. Because you don't have the same population necessarily moving like that, right? So you're having people yeah, and the also they just, area and the They just don't area. go one direction, you right. know, they're actually moving back. Oh, so you forward. do get people from the circle moving back into the oval area. Yeah, probably. Um, and then also, actually, interestingly, after that, um, so maybe around 2000 years ago, mm -hmm. we have people who start going into um, the actual Marshall Islands and Caroline Islands. Um, so in the rest of the northern part mm -hmm. um, of the, the Pacific here. Um, and, and these people, they are, you know, moving in between this region, but also communicating with people from Vanuatu, mm. um, so and the Solomon Islands. So as I say, it's, yeah, it's like really it's looking really, very connected now. Yeah, they're just sailing all around the place, Fantastic. really, and exploring all these islands, exploring the ocean. Wonderful. Um, and then so, yeah. Um, obviously, there's more islands off to the east. Um, so when does that happen? <laughs> yes. So you know, once all of this is happening. Um, around 1,000 years um, ago, yeah, uh, people start actually moving east. Um, and I've put a really big circle Holy because God. what is interesting with this story, I think, is that they, they you know, don't just move east, mm. but they're actually going everywhere because at the same time, when people are exploring um, and uh, settling all the islands in the east, they're also... Um, visiting uh, islands which are on, in the west. And we actually have islands uh, which are in the western part of the Pacific where people speak the same language from the same family as people in the east. So mm -hmm. that's what it's called Polynesia and Polynesian languages. Um, so we know that people have been going in this direction to settle, but they also go back, kind of. Um, and also what is interesting with this period of time is that they settle absolutely every island in the Pacific. So there are in the Pacific, you have really small 
um, difficult to live on islands. Mm -hmm. And they've been called mystery islands because when Europeans enter the Pacific in the 18th century, they found islands which are inhabited but with the remains of occupation. Um, so they so would have we stopped know, there and then moved on, I suppose. Yeah, we know that people uh, settled on every island, but some islands were really too, um, you know, far away from other islands or, or they were really too difficult without mm -hmm. any resource. So in the end, the community moved away, um, but we, we know that they've been there. So they it, it shows that, you know, the people in the Pacific, they really explored and visited all of the lands that exist there. And they actually didn't stop. They, they went all the way to South America. And we know that because they brought back um, the sweet potato that was really, really useful. So was um, distributed really quickly throughout mm -hmm. all of the Pacific, all the way to Papua New Guinea. Um, and they probably actually also um, brought back some genes. So, you know, there, is, <laughs> there, there were some babies being born. <laughs> That's great. So the reason um, I'm really interested in this particular movement is because I guess almost everything I know about human migration in the Pacific comes from the documentary Moana. <laughs> and in Moana, there's famously that the pause where humans, um, it seemed like they'd stopped exploring and then they started again. Um, yeah. Archaeologically, is that is that true? I think um, it's one of these issues with archaeology. So I think we, we've been thinking like that for a long time mm. because we've been a, a bit obsessed by the Lapita story and then the Polynesian um, movement. I don't know, Europeans have always been obsessed by the, the history of Polynesian um, in particular. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've always only looked at the southern part, I guess, of the Pacific and then the eastern parts kind of forgetting that there are islands in the north. So we've always thought about, you know, the people are moving with the Lapita culture and they go to Samoa uh, and they arrive there roughly 3,000 years ago, but then they don't move east before, you know, 1,000 so, uh, years yeah. ago. So what happens during 2,000 years, there is a long pause um, and that's the story in Moana. Uh, but when you start having a larger, you know, observation um, and, and look at the whole map, you realize that during this pause, people are actually settling all the islands and the low-lying islands that are in um, in the northern part and what is called Macronesia today. Um, so they're actually still, you know, they're still, it's still moving and exploring. So it's kind of a continuation as well of all these movements when people enter Polynesia. So I, I think this idea of a pause might need to be reevaluated probably. Interesting to know that my uh, hopes and dreams about that particular documentary might have to... <laughs> no, but apart from that, I really like Moana. I think <laughs> there are a lot of... They did really good work. Um, for, for example, I, I recognize a lot of the trees that are in the, the you know, in the cartoon. They did that really good work on that. That is a level of detail on the animation um, And part. even the material culture, um, you can recognize the tapa that mm. are done uh, in this region. Um, so, no, apart from that, it's, it's nice. I love Moana. Fantastic. Good endorsement. Um, a question has just come in through the chat. Leah would like to know, were they quite transient through settling and moving of the islands or did they stay for long periods of time on the islands? Oh, yeah. Um, no, no. I think when people reach an island, uh, we have signs that show that they settled and they stayed. Mm -hmm. But what happens is that after a few generations, some of these people would go and explore further and settle on this island and then the community will grow and then mm -hmm. some people will live again. And actually in the cultural anthropology of the societies in the Pacific show that there is, in a lot of societies, there is this um, um, mechanism that the firstborn uh, need to leave the settlement of his dad and go and create his own. So that's probably a mechanism that also existed at the time and, and probably played a role in the exploration of the Pacific. I guess that's the thing about islands, they're going to be limited in terms of resources and the number of people that you can support. More it's possible, than but it's probably not the only um, explanation because in the western, southwestern part of the Pacific, for example, New Caledonia is a really big island and it's really rich. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it was a lack of resources that pushed people um, to keep you know, sailing around. It's first of all, because of all this and this history, they were amazing sailors, uh, and they just they were just at home <laughs> on the sea, you know, it, not just on the land as we would think as Europeans right. maybe, but the sea was their home. 
Um, so it wasn't scary to no, go okay. on, on a small canoe and explore um, the ocean because it was really their home. So mm. then maybe it's, not it's because a lot they had easier. to, but because they wanted to. Yeah, and actually, it's it's the title I gave you, the Sea of Island. It's mm. it's the way that one intellectual, um, uh, Epeli Haofa, who's a Pacific Islander, uh, and he was trying to explain to Westerners the way that Pacifica actually see uh, the Pacific. It's not a big ocean with isolated island. It's a sea of island. Um, so all these islands are connected and they're mm. everywhere around you when you're on a canoe. So you're not lost on a canoe. That's fantastic. We could talk about this all day long, um, but I want to move on to the other subject, which of course is the role of women in archaeology, because this is also a place where you had, I guess, the earliest women in this field. Um, what drew you to this research, first of all? Uh, into the um, looking into, into the, the story of the first women. Yeah. So it, I guess it's first because uh, I have a background in history as well as um, archaeology and archaeology. Mm -hmm itself and so I became involved in a project that wanted to establish the field of history of science uh, looking specifically at the history of archaeology in the Pacific because that has not been done before. Mm -hmm. um, so I worked in this project at the ANU um, with Professor Matthew Spriggs and um, a larger team um, and so I was in charge of looking into the history of francophone archaeology um, and I realized that it was really difficult to um, find the history of the first women, even though I knew there were women who were involved mm -hmm. as archaeologists or early archaeologists. How ironic um, so, that you couldn't reconstruct their stories as easily. Yeah, it's more difficult because they're harder to find in the archives. Or sometimes when you go and manage to go back to the archives and to the sources, you realize that they are in the archives, but their story didn't make it to the narratives mm -hmm. that kept the big names of um, the big professional male archaeologists. Um, so I thought I needed to have a specific project focusing on, on these women. And so I guess, um, what are some things that you discovered that either surprised you or maybe uh, shocked you a little bit about this? Um, so as I said, the first thing is that um, there, there were women uh, mm -hmm. from the early beginning. So um, the interest for Westerner uh, into the archaeology of the Pacific started from the beginning. They entered the Pacific around the 18th or even earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's really in the 19th century that what we call today an archaeology. So looking at um, material remains to tell the story of um, the people. Um, that actually started. And from the 19th century, you had women who were involved in the field. Um, so they were there from the beginning. Uh, but yeah, it was a bit <laughs> interesting, even though maybe not completely surprising, uh, to realize that they were not so present in the narratives. Mm -hmm. And so we had to redo this work of bringing them back uh, in there. Um, and then also I realized um, very naively that um, it's, it's also just about things that we tend to forget, mm. that it's all about basic human rights uh, that you didn't have as a woman uh, until very late. Um, so, for example, just to give you a very shocking and basic example, in France, as a woman, you couldn't access your own salary without the signature and authorization um, of your father or uh, husband until 1964, I think. Ooh, goodness. Yeah. That's quite recent. <laughs> that is a living memory. So, I was yeah, expecting so 1800s, obviously, no? <laughs> in the 19th century, okay. they couldn't even access good education. Uh, or they, uh, no, actually, it's, it's wrong. They access good education, but they didn't have the diploma. So they couldn't mm -hmm. become professionals. And, they, and it was very difficult for them to travel independently. Uh, of course, and to have this kind of freedom. But even in the 20th century, there were still a lot of limitations um, to be an archaeologist when you were a woman. Um, and I just want to also highlight that um, what is really exciting as well is that we are able to find, and I hope tell the story of indigenous um, women archaeologists who had several layers to um, travel through, obviously, uh, in terms of basic human rights um, and, and respect. Um, but also, they interestingly had some um, very important power because they were, uh, some of these women were really local experts mm -hmm. uh, recognized by their community in terms of the horror traditions. Uh, for example, 
um, around the sites. And so when these women became involved, and there are, there are two specific women that I, I know of, um, one who was over on Natua in French Polynesia and another uh, Victoria Rapahongo in, on Easter Island. Um, and so they really become key for the archaeologists who wanted to work there because they were the one who were able to negotiate access to archaeological sites, give authorization to the archaeologists to work there. They were the one giving them the oral tradition, so the significance of the sites um, and the history for interpretation of these sites. Um, and sometimes like Aurora, who was really special um, and who worked in the museum, she was also the one with the most expensive knowledge about uh, the material culture uh, and the archives. And she was also controlling what the archaeologists were doing, um, because she was making sure that they didn't leave with the material remains that she felt should stay Which in the museum. Which did tend to happen around that era. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So she, she was really, really important. Uh, and, and it's interesting because Aura, for example, you find her in all the acknowledgement of the archaeologists working in the 1960s in French Polynesia. Um, she worked a lot with American archaeologists from uh, the Bishop Museum in Hawaii who mm -hmm. came to Tahiti to work. Uh, and in all their papers and all their reports, they, she's in all the acknowledgements and they always say how it would have been impossible for them to do the work without her. Mm -hmm. um, and in the reports in particular, you can see that they have several sessions where they work in the museum with her. And then she goes with them to do the excavation. She excavates with them and she negotiates the access to the site. And also, I think what is really important is that she, she was speaking French, English and Tahitian. So she could translate, you know, what the archaeologists were doing to the people and the like other an way around. She sounds like an incredible woman. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, really couldn't have done um, it without her. Um, and I'm really so these glad kind of stories, yeah, yeah, they really need to be told and recognized Absolutely. much more. Absolutely. I'm really glad that you have now this collection of tales to tell that perhaps up until now haven't really had their moment to shine. Um, yeah. I've just had another question come through from Liv. What are your thoughts on the impact of climate change and the future of research in these Pacific Islands? So That's it's a, a huge one. question. <laughs> Um, yes, because um, obviously we know, uh, and scientists and, and um, inhabitants of the islands have been telling it for a long time and trying to make it really loud uh, that uh, climate change is going to have, is already having a huge impact on this island, and especially the low lying atolls that mm. we've talked about at the beginning. Um, so it's, it's really important for Pacific Islanders that we do something um, to not only try to reverse the thing, which is a bit too late, but to adapt to that very quickly. But at the same time, uh, I think this is where archaeology and especially environmental archaeology can you know, play a role uh, in using the past to provide uh, example and ideas into the way that you can adapt to changes. Uh, and, and manage in a more sustainable way your environment without idealizing the past either, because obviously it's not you know people who are living in harmony that never happen anywhere in the world. Um, so it's it's about trying to understand what went wrong and what worked, and and also use that mm -hmm. uh, for the future, I guess. Absolutely, lessons to be learned there. And I'm glad that you yeah. highlighted the fact that it wasn't perfect. We do tend to put on the roasting glasses and look at the past and say, oh, yeah, look, look, it's, sunshine and rainbows it's, for miles around. Exactly. It's, it's always a bit in between. So there are a lot of um, discussions around the awful impact of human beings on the island. Mm -hmm. and for example, Easter Island has been used as an example of that so many times, you know, like people coming and cutting down all the trees, etc which is not completely true. It's much more complicated than that. But it's, there is also a discussion about everywhere in the world, you know, traditional society living in harmony with our environment. And it's not completely true either. Uh, of course, they had developed a specific deep knowledge of their environment, but they also uh, had, as a human being, a destructive impact on their environment. So it's about understanding the complexity of the reality and using it um, in a better way. Absolutely. One more question just coming in from Leah again. Um, do you think there are still more stories of women yet to be told in this region from both an Indigenous and archaeological perspective? 
Yes, plenty. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So there are a number of women that I want to tell um, stories about um, that I've identified, but I'm pretty sure there are more. And actually, since I started this project, I regularly receive um, you know emails from colleagues about new women that they discovered <laughs> or or sometimes a new realize. species of woman was found today <laughs> exactly or sometimes it's women that we've we've seen their names um or they're only their family names for example but we didn't realize ah, that women the infamous uh, surname start, conundrum mm. start looking into their stories and realize that they did much more than what we thought or sometimes also very often it's about couples as well mm. where it's, it was mainly the men whose story remained uh, because the way that science used to work, um, publications were in the name of the husband, even though he worked with his wife. Mm -hmm. um, so it's also about rediscovering the story of the wife. Um, so maybe if I have a bit of time, I can tell the example of um, Betty Shuttler, uh, who's another person I really like. Um, who, and also she has an important story related to Lapita and the discovery of the Lapita culture in the Pacific. So she, she's an American woman, uh, and uh, she studied archaeology uh, in the mid-20th century in the U.S., mm -hmm. and she married um, a fellow student archaeologist, and she goes with him um, because he's supposed to go and field work in New Caledonia in 1952 uh, with a professional archaeologist, um, and so she goes with him uh, as the assistant uh, wife, and she's the only one in the whole team who speak French, um, which is a bit, you know, useful when you go to that New Caledonia. That is good to have. <laughs> um, and so she wasn't, she was still a student. So she wasn't, you know, an archaeologist, professional archaeologist at the time, but her husband wasn't either. He, he was still studying to get towards his PhD. Um, but in the end, this expedition um, is the one that discovered a very important Lapita site. Mm -hmm. And thanks to this discovery, um, archaeologists were able to um, realize the importance of the Lapita culture in the history of the settlement of the Pacific. Um, and the name Lapita come from uh, New Caledonia, from this site, uh, which in the local Haveke language is Hapeta. Um, and so that, that became Lapita with European way of talking. Um, and so it's really interesting because it's remembered as the Gifford and Shutter expedition. Edward Gifford was a professional archaeologist and mm -hmm. Richard Shutter, who was the husband. But Betty Shutter has been kind of forgotten in there. Um, she was the assistant. But then when you start looking into more detail in the archives, um, she was the only one speaking French. So she was the one recording all the oral tradition. Probably she was the one who recorded the name mm -hmm. of the site. So the Lapita name. Um, also, there are a lot of images, uh, really good photography uh, archives around this expedition. And she's always seen in the picture doing the excavation ah. and working with the, the Kanak collaborators, mm -hmm. um, who we also have to identify, by the way. Um, and so she's, you can see she's always with them. So she's obviously because she's the only one speaking French. So she was always establishing this communication, which is really important. Um, and interestingly, there's a book that has been written about this expedition, uh, and which is still the book about Richard Schuttler and it was yes, the three famous men who were named. <laughs> exactly. But in this book, uh, the authors of the book actually say, you know, uh, the most interesting field notes and the most detailed notes are the one taken by Betty Schuttler, mm. the assistant. Um, so, again, there's a lot more work to be done into kind of reestablishing her importance and her legacy because she, she then had a really successful career as an archaeologist, um, also working in Vanuatu. And then she had to shift to American archaeology. Um, she was obviously interested in North American archaeology, but also she became a, a divorced mother mm -hmm. um, who also wanted to have a career. So it was obviously a lot easier, I guess, to work close to home. Um, so it's really important, for example, to tell this kind of story. Speaking of stories, and we're going to finish up with one more woman's story in archaeology, which is your own story. Um, I'm always curious about interesting women in interesting areas and how they got there. Um, archaeology is not probably the most stereotypically female job out there. It's got all the hallmarks of things that young women tend to be warned against. It is outdoors. It is often in far away exotic and therefore potentially dangerous places. Mm -hmm. um, you do get a little bit dirty. You do tend to travel a lot with all sorts of people. Um, 
So is this something that your parents warned you against? Were they supportive? And what kind of drew you into this field? Mm. Um, so the first thing I have to say is that today, the majority of students in archaeology are women. So it's quite interesting. Um, yeah, it, there's there's actually a huge um, imbalance. Not hooray. <laughs> uh, but that does change. That does I will retract change. my hooray. Towards the end of PhD and when you get into people who are actually the one um, who are professional archaeologists. Um, so we'll see how it evolves mm. in the future. But today there is this interesting demographics. Um, it's a bit of a swing. Yeah. Uh, but then uh, about your question, I, I was very lucky that my parents uh, were always very supportive of this kind of thing. And it's actually because of them. It's, it's all their fault if I become an archaeologist because I, I grew up in New Caledonia um, and from a, a New Caledonian family, several generations. So they always gave us this really strong um, attachment to the Pacific and to the island and, and respect and curiosity for indigenous culture of the Pacific. Um, and so that was always you know, present and inter an interest of mine to try to understand the history of the Pacific um, culture. Um, but also we had the kind of childhood, me and my sister, where we were spending a lot of time outdoor, being dirty. Um, so I really wanted to be able to have a job that, you know, kept me into this kind of dynamic. Um, and at the same time, uh, I wanted a job that also allowed me to spend some time reading books and working in labs. And, and so archaeology is actually perfect for that because you have these two um, options that you can access. You can you can be out there uh, in the field being really dirty. <laughs> Which is uh, so much fun, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> go to like dangerous places, yes. places and remote places. But you can also spend a lot of time in, you know, very not dangerous libraries. Um, and <laughs> I don't know about the libraries labs. you're going to, but my local library is hell on earth. <laughs> <laughs> well, All yeah, sorts of things. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Um, so you can have all these different sides and, and, and also you don't have to do all of them. It depends on what you specialize, uh, which areas um, and what type of expertise you specialize in. And so there is a range of diverse mm -hmm. kind of careers that you can um, and then life um, lifestyles that you can experience by going through archaeology. Fantastic. And we are running slightly out of time. I just did a call out for any last questions for Emily. Please do put them in. This is your very last chance. But we're going to finish up on um, some advice, perhaps for any young people watching who are thinking about this as a career. Um, what would be your top tip for getting into this line of work? Um, I guess there are a lot of uh, field work opportunities. Well, maybe not right now because of all the COVID restrictions, but in the near future, hopefully. Um, hopefully, uh, there are a lot of fieldwork um, opportunities that um, accept volunteers. Um, so it's about being on the lookout. Um, UWA run a uh, field school, uh, and I know that they have an open day uh, each time they do the field school. Um, so people can come and watch and see, you know, kind of see how it happens and then get in contact. Uh, and just, you know, try and have some experience um, and read some books. Um, yeah. <laughs> used to and go just, dangerous libraries. <laughs> yeah. It, I guess it's about trying and see if, if that interests you and, and realize that it's very diverse. Mm -hmm. It's not just one typical kind of um, Indiana Jones kind of thing. We are going to have to wrap it up, Emily. It's been a delight. Um, if we want to find out more about your research, where should we go? What should we do? Uh, so there's a website that UWA created on this specific project about the history of the first women archaeologist. Um, it's called Pacific Matilda. So if you if you, if you go down in the um, description below, so just below the video in the ex description, if you expand it, it is the very final website, um, yeah. which I'm just opening up now. So this will be, is this more about your, ah, this is finding women in the history of the Pacific. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, so that's about the, the recent one. And then... Um, about the, the archaeology of the Pacific in general. Uh, well, the, the main uh, and really uh, nice to read um, synthesis on that is a, is a book by archaeologist Patrick Kirsch, um, who's called On the Road of the Winds. Um, and that's a really good book about a general mm -hmm. presentation about the archaeological history of the Pacific Islands.
Fantastic. I'm going to have to wrap it up there. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. You've been amazing. I've learned so much new things um, in the chat log as well. I can see that the sentiment is very nice. Everyone's thanking you so much for your time. So we are going to have to say goodbye. Thank you again, Emily, for joining us. We'll do a lovely wave. Thank you, Tina. And audience, Thank you, if you are interested in marine research with the Oceans Institute, please do like, subscribe, comment, um, turn your notifications on and share the rest of our live streams with your friends. There is a whole body of streams out there. This is stream number 11, I believe, and they range everywhere from plastic pollution management to um, marine archaeology, as you saw, also things like um, science in um, space and marine um, science and how they cross over, all sorts of interesting topics there. Please do check out the rest of our streams. We are going to have to say goodbye. Thank you again, folks. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.